Unity of Houston is an inclusive church where we seek to understand and live the teachings of Jesus and other spiritual masters. At Unity, we welcome all people from all spiritual paths and every walk of life. We celebrate the diversity of our city and of our world, and we teach love, tolerance, and oneness, seeking to live in harmony with open minds and open hearts. Wherever you are in your spiritual path, you are always welcome at Unity. Join us and discover that the life of your dreams is already within you. All right, what are we talking about? Let's see. Oh, yeah, the revelation of wholeness. Thank you all for being here today. This is the first of a six-week series. When I was in seminary, first beginning to give speaks, speaks? This is going to be an interesting week, I'll tell you that. <laughs> and beginning to give talks. <laughs> uh, my homiletics teacher, she said, well, you know, Michael, a beginner's mistake is that when you're given a topic and, you're, and a chance to speak, you're going to try and tell them everything you know. So what I've done is given myself six weeks to tell you everything I know <laughs> about the revelation of wholeness, and we'll see if I can get it all in. We're going to be using uh, the idea of body, mind, and soul. So two weeks on the body, two weeks on the mind, two weeks on the soul. And the way it's sort of come together over the past weeks and even months as I've been pre preparing for this series is the first week for each of those, I want to focus on the spiritual principles and perspectives of wholeness to really talk about why we believe that we can reveal wholeness through our, our physical body, through the uh, capacities of the mind and heart. I cheated a little bit on that one. And the soul being that unique expression of the one that is you and how we can begin to understand and know the wholeness of God that exists resident within us and then begin to live it into our relationships and finances, into our work, into all parts of our, of our lives. It's an incredible journey. So six weeks from now, I won't even recognize you guys. <laughs> you will have been so transformed by revealing your wholeness that all problems will have dissipated yeah, there are going to be lots of engagement parties going on, and uh, the tithing is going to go up so high in this church. I just, it's so good. Maybe. I'm open. There was a couple. They were, uh, this is from Instagram. I've given up on Twitter, but now I'm on Instagram for my little sermon jokes. And this woman said, my husband and I went over all of our finances, all of our accounts, and we were delighted to discover that we have enough money to quit our jobs and live and do whatever we want as long as we die by Sunday. <laughs> and then a couple of weeks later, the same person on Instagram, she said, my husband and I have decided that we will take this new practice of never going to bed angry. So we haven't slept in four days. <laughs> All right, now let's get to it. The principle behind revealing wholeness, and I do have to acknowledge uh, my dear friend, Maggie Cole, the revelation of wholeness was her title. She created a, a weekend workshop on this, this title, and I got to present it with her twice, once in Santa Rosa, California, and once in Dallas at my former community there. And the idea being that you're already enough. You're already an expression of divine creativity and power and light and love. That's what you are. All you have to do is reveal it. Easier said than done, I know. Um, it's a journey, it's a process, but it's also an intention and a choice. And so if we can simply know the truth of who we are, we can live it. But many of us receive bad information about who and what we are. And so we're going to talk today about the body. And I want to start with our, one of our co-founders, Myrtle Fillmore. She was afflicted with tuberculosis at a young age. And she spent many years believing that she was incurably weak and sick. And she attended a lecture by the metaphysician e, Dr. E.B. Weeks in 1886. And there, she learned of the innate potential for divine healing through the use of affirmative prayer. And she began regularly affirming this, I am a child of God, and therefore I do not inherit sickness. 
Repeat after me. I am a child of God, and therefore I do not inherit sickness. Over time, she was healed of tuberculosis that had threatened her life. She's considered the mother of unity. In her writings, she demonstrates a kind and nurturing, very mothering energy. But make no mistake, she was a woman of great power and a rock of solid faith and understanding on how to use her faith to transform lives and heal her body. This is a couple of quotes from Myrtle. Sometimes we pray to a God outside of ourselves. It is the God in the midst of us that frees and heals. She says this, God is the one perfect life flowing through us. God is the one pure substance out of which our organism is formed. God is the power that gives us motive power, the strength that holds us upright and allows us to exercise our members, the wisdom that gives us intelligence in every cell of our body, every thought in our mind. God is the only reality of us. All else is but a shadow that is cast by some foolish belief or unwise combination of thoughts and the elements of being. When we let the light flood us with his sunshine, all clouds vanish and we begin to see ourselves in new ways of doing, which lead to wholeness and health and satisfaction and growth. Man, she is a powerful woman. And she demonstrated that power of shifting what we know to be true. She was a young woman, young mom, who was sick. And yet she just heard someone tell her some different words, offer a different perspective, and she believed it. Her, her heart and soul recognized the truth of it, and she began to practice it, to live it, to work with this principle that I'm a child of God. I do not inherit sickness. And it was a process of healing. The stories that came to us said that she would sit in a chair and place a chair opposite her, and then she would place a picture of Jesus there. Jesus as the elder brother, as the way shower, as the exemplar of one who knew his connection to the infinite. And she began to speak to her own body, to be aware that there was more here than she had been told. There was more here than she had yet experienced. That's what we're here to do. In unity, that's our whole game, is come to be aware that there is more. I love, Giovanna, what you shared today about creativity. It's not just the information that we have already, that we have direct connection to infinite creativity, that the light of God is our light. The life of God is our life. But if we don't know it, we don't live it. We don't reveal it, we don't express it. Ernest Holmes said, the realization of the presence of God is the most powerful healing agency known to the mind of man. Then Myrtle went on to talk about forgiveness. I love this part. She says, I went to all the life centers in my body and I spoke words of truth to them, words of strength and power. I asked their forgiveness for the foolish, ignorant course that I had pursued in the past when I had condemned them called them weak, inefficient, and diseased. I did not become discouraged at their being slow to wake up, but kept right on, both silently and aloud, declaring words of truth until the organs responded. And neither did I forget to tell them that they were free, unlimited spirit. I told them they were no longer in bondage to the carnal mind, that they are not corruptible flesh, but centers of life, and energy omnipresent. Ashes to ashes and dust to dust. You've heard that, right? What part of the Bible is that from? You might know. You know it's not actually in the Bible. <laughs> it's just something Christian preachers started saying at funerals. Now, there are Bible verses that do talk about similar ideas. In, in Genesis... 
Abraham says, I am but dust and ash. And in a dualistic religion, which most of what Christianity has practiced is dualism and Judaism and, and Islam, that God is out there and the material world is fallen, corrupt, not holy. And it's not hard to make the leap then. Then therefore, our bodies must be less than divine. And so this is the story we've been told. As a matter of fact, some of us have been told the story that our bodies are not only not divine, but they're shameful. They're to be hidden, to not to be loved, but to be pushed away. To reclaim our wholeness in this, this thing that we, all of us here, I see have one. we must be willing to tell a new story about what it is. I love when Myrtle says that she said, I did not forget to tell them, I'm talking about all the parts of her body, particularly those that were exhibiting what appeared to be disease or illness. She said, I did not forget to tell them that they are pure, unlimited spirit. But what? Back to ashes and ashes and dust and dust. Another place where another scripture that we think that, that maybe where those Christian ministers found this is in Ecclesiastes, where there's a, bar, a verse that says, spirit returns to spirit, but dust returns to dust. There's a separation. And what Myrtle is saying is, there's no separation. I tell my body that it too is spirit. Energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. Who knows what that is? Yeah, amen. <laughs> Einstein. Mass, form, is light that has been slowed down. The photon, the smallest particle that can be measured, is light, pure light. It makes up every atom and every cell. You are a light being. And Jesus said... That if the eye be single, the whole body will be filled with light. The word that he used for uh, single, which I have forgotten to put in my notes this morning, but I know this, it is also translated as whole, as one, not divided. The physical body is spirit expressed. And if we can get our mind undivided around that truth, we will have a different experience of walking around in a body. That's what we're talking about. This is the spiritual principle we're working with. I do have to caution. We do not practice metaphysical malpractice in this church. <laughs> For ourselves or others, let me tell you what that is. If we see a friend who has an illness, we go, you must have a divided mind. What are you thinking that would demonstrate that? We don't do that anymore. <laughs> we do not. All of us have experienced illness. All of us have experienced issues and challenges in the body. And guess what? All of us are going to die. I know, Joanne. I was like... <laughs> There's a story, well, it's not a story, he wrote about it. Um, our other co-founder, Charles Fillmore, he had thought that, well, if this is true, if this body is spirit, that I can continue to regenerate it forever using spiritual principle. He had a good run, but he died. I don't think Myrtle ever held any illusions about that. At some point, she was like, I hope that works out for you, Charles. I'm out of here on to better things. <laughs> It's not a mistake, it's not an error when we get illness. It's not wrong when beloved ones have a disease and die. That's just part of the human experience. But if we can begin to see God in all of it, I do believe we can experience dramatic re restoration of health and vitality. But even when the body is coming to the end of its journey. It's different. We have the experience of God being present here too. 
We had an amazing memorial service yesterday for Janice, Janice Jones. You, if you've been here for any time, she was always the lady that sat right over there taking notes on Sunday and taking photographs at every event for decades. She had beaten cancer several times using these principles. And this last time, I thought she was going to do it again. And she did, too. When she told me that she had gotten cancer again on a Sunday out in the courtyard, she was like, Michael, it's just cancer. It doesn't know who I am. And she, hmm, such power, fierce and gentle and generous. And she was complete in this body. And she died in wholeness. And I would love to know what she's getting up to next. <laughs> she's an example for all of us of how to work with spiritual principles in the body all the way to the end. Real briefly, I want to talk about what it means. I chose for my title today, Your Body is a Temple. Traditionally, in Christianity, there is this dualistic teaching. But if you look closely, you can find this, this mystical understanding, too, in the Gospel of John. Two verses in the first verse in the first chapter I want to read. Verse one of one, chapter one. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and word was with God, and the word was God. Hold on to that. And then in verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now that is typically traditionally understood to be talking about Jesus of Nazareth and only Jesus of Nazareth. But didn't Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth also say, the things that I have done, greater things shall those do who come after. Jesus never said, I'm the only one. He never said, I'm the only begotten. As a matter of fact, Meister Eckhart, a medieval Christian mystic, he said, yes, God only has one begotten son, but the eternal is forever begetting the unbegotten, the only begotten. That you are the only begotten of God into expression. I am the only begotten. The Word made flesh, the divine idea of wholeness, walking around with arms and legs, or like our dear Joey, wheeling around in a fabulous Joey mobile. We are the only begotten of God. Because there is how many of us? I'm holding up the hands. One one power, one life, one source that reveals itself in infinite expressions, but we retain our unity with God, with each other. So when we talk about the body being the temple, this comes from 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are more than your limited separate self. The body is a hard place to do this work. Prosperity is actually pretty easy. Abundance works pretty well. It's uh, because money is very liquid, very fluid. It can move really quickly. You can have no money in your checking account, and you can have thousands of dollars in your checking account quickly. The body is a little denser, have you noticed? <laughs> if you're trying to work with metaphysical principles and move the body. Myrtle showed us the way. She said, I did not give up when they were slow to wake up. My journey with the body has been huh, hard. Not with major illness like tuberculosis or others. I was eight years old. I'd been playing. It was a summer because I'd run around with just shorts, no shoes, no shirt. That's what I did. I was, an, I was a little nature boy. Just brown, 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 and just loved it. But I'd come in, I was sitting in front of the window unit, that's all we had in our house, cooling off, and my mom was looking at me, and then she said, Michael, you're fat. I was like, I am? She said, yeah, you have these rolls right here on your belly. I think you should go on Weight Watchers with me. That was the beginning. I know now that my mom was trying to save me from a lifetime of pain that she had endured around her weight and body image. But what she did instead is she gave me the legacy of that in that moment. I never again took my shirt off without being self-conscious. How many diets have I been on? All of them. 
And being a gay man, like, it's a thing about being fit and healthy and looking like a 25-year-old Calvin Klein underwear model when you're 60. <laughs> it's the thing that we're supposed to be. And it's not just us, it's in our culture that the only acceptable type of body is a perfect, youthful body that is strong and fit and thin. And so I'm 57. Maybe by 60 I'll have that underwear model body, but <laughs> if I give my resignation in a couple of years, you know where I've gone. No. <laughs> I don't see that as my future career, my retirement job. But it has been a long and difficult journey. I always say, and it's really true, that's why I keep saying it, I've always been a very quick study except about anything that matters. <laughs> Those lessons take a long time. I'm slow to wake up sometimes. I will share with you, I've had a major shift around this, though. That recently, I... Um, I recognize that at 57, I have no physical impedances to my life. I'm strong, I'm fit, I'm free, I can do anything I want. Sure, I'd like to have a little less, but I'm good. And I thought, well, why do I need to do anything about it then? And then I realized, oh, if I want to still be this way when I'm 75, I sure as heck better do something now. So I have recently recommitted to fitness and nutrition in a way that is, it's different than anything I've ever done. Also to sleep, rest. I'm forming a new relationship with my body temple, not trying to get it to look like the Calvin Klein model, because I've always been disappointed at the results. Even when I was rock hard. I mean, just, I mean, there's a time in my 30s that I just, I had to work six days a week with a trainer. I still found every flaw and imperfection. But I did look good, looking back on it now. <laughs> but I'm not doing that. Many of you have heard me say this when I was uh, on a retreat in Costa Rica a couple years ago. I was having a moment of shame around the body, and it's older, and I'm single again. Oh, my Lord, what's going to happen? And this thought occurred to me that my job is to love this body as it ages. And I don't know where that thought came from, but it has transformed everything. But it's been a process. It's been three years now of just working with this idea to love the body. So I think about what Myrtle did with her body. She, she asked forgiveness from her body of all the ways that she had held it as wrong. So that's been a part of my process, too. I don't know what your relationship with your body is, but I'm guessing that there may be room for some of this there, too, to accept and love it just as it is. But there's a paradox here, too. To love the body as it is means to care for it as you would a precious gift. If you're given a precious gift that is fragile and needs care, you're not going to throw it in the back of the closet and forget about it. You're going to give it pride of place, and you're going to make sure that it's nurtured and cared for. So next week, we're going to talk about that, the practices that we can take up to reveal wholeness in our body. Oh, here's a little preview. Years ago, I was at my church in Dallas, and a friend of mine hadn't been there for several weeks, like some of you. I'm not going to name names. And here you are today. And he had lost weight. He looked amazing. And I went up to him and was like, Lee, oh, my God, you look great. What did you do? And he said, well, I just ate less and exercised more. And I was like, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't ready for that message. <laughs> I do want to share with you, too, I've never told this part, that part two of that story, is that Lee uh, took his own life not too long after that. That he was a person who desperately wanted to be perfect in his body and everywhere else, and he couldn't, he couldn't find a way to love the imperfect. So my call to you this week is to love and accept your beautiful body with all the funny little things it does just as it is 
If you won't mind, I invite you just to place your hands on yourself in a way that feels comfortable. And if you might have a bad knee or something, you might place your hand there, just whatever that is. And we're going to do a little Myrtle action on it. Myrtle said that she did not forget to tell the parts of her body that they are free, unlimited spirits. So if you'll repeat after me, beloved body, you are free, unlimited spirit. You are free, unlimited spirit. And we're healed. It's a process. The thing about our body is this. It won't lie to you. We lie to it, but it doesn't lie to you. That if, it, if it's hurting, it needs attention. If it's tired, it needs rest. If it's hungry, it needs food. We don't always listen well. And that's another challenge for us this week is to just be with what is. Love it and listen. And give your beautiful body what it needs. Would you pray with me now? In this moment, I remember and recognize the life of God is living in and through and as me. And I celebrate this life of God in every cell, in every tissue and organ and system in this beautiful temple, the body. And so I do release any thoughts that it's not good enough, that it's too big, too little, too weak, too strong. I don't care. I just love it just as it is. And this love for the body re begins to re reverberate throughout all of my life experience that I'm no longer in opposition to myself. And that I'm free to be used by spirit for the work that is mine to do in this world, to rise up in joy and love, and to be that for others. So all within the sound of my voice in this moment, what I know is that there is a healing taking place right now, a revelation of wholeness in the body and in the mind and in the soul. That there is beautiful work for us to do. There is beautiful love for us to experience. There is joy that is ours, and we say yes. Thank you, God. Amen. You're amazing. You're gorgeous. No more robocalls. <laughs> Maybe. We'll see. But I know that we've been isolated and lonely, a lot of us, and so community is where we get that fixed. And so I'm just in so grateful that you're here. And if no one has told you today that they love you, I love you. God bless you. Thank you for watching this message today. I'd like to invite you to join us in person here on campus at Unity of Houston for Sunday morning or Wednesday evening services. If you can't be with us here on our campus, you can still join us live on Facebook or on our website, unityhouston.org, Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Central.